Hi, everybody. This is Kara Fitzgerald at New Frontiers in Functional Medicine. I would not be here month in and month out for the past six years without the generous support of our sponsors. And I want to tell you about them and please check out their websites and check their products out. Biotics Research. For over 40 years, the foundation of biotics research has been innovation and quality. Their goals remain unchanged. Innovative ideas, carefully researched concepts, and product development with advanced analytical and manufacturing techniques. Biotics nutritional products are of superior quality and effectiveness and available exclusively to healthcare professionals. Visit them at bioticsresearch.com. Integrative Therapeutics. Integrative Therapeutics is focused on inspiring a better lifestyle through better health. By providing meticulously formulated nutritional supplements and valuable resources, Integrative Therapeutics promises to enrich your patients and embolden your practice. Welcome to your Integrative Therapeutics. Find them at integrativepro.com. And finally, I want to give a shout out to my friends over at Rupa Health. They make lab testing easy, fabulous, doable for both you, the clinician, and you, the person being prescribed the lab, the patient. Consider using Rupa as just a super, super, super smart solution to all your laboratory needs. Visit them at rupahealth.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome to New Frontiers in Functional Medicine, where we are, of course, bringing you the best minds in functional medicine. And today is no exception, as you can see. I am sitting next to my good friend and colleague, Dr. Vincent Fedre. Um, you know who he is. He's been on the podcast before, but let me just give you a little bit of his background, and then we're going to jump into talking about his latest book. Um, Dr. Vincent Pedre is the medical, medical director of Pedre Integrative Health, and he's the founder of Dr. Pedre Wellness, CEO and founder of Happy Gut Life, LLC, and has worked as a nutraceutical consultant and spokesperson for Nature MD. He's also a functional medicine certified practitioner, and he has a concierge practice in New York City. He believes gut is the gateway to excellent wellness, and his new book, The Gut Smart Protocol, features a 14-day personalized gut healing plan based on the Gut Smart Quiz. It's the culmination of years of research and clinical experience as a functional gut health expert. Dr. Pedre, it's really great to have you back on New Frontiers. Thanks for joining me. It's a great pleasure to be back. Thank you for inviting me back. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited about your new book. I'm excited about the work you're doing. I love your, you know, I see you on Instagram. I mean, I'm not on Instagram a ton, but you're, you know, when I, I mean, I, I am a professional and my, my business is there, but when I go on, I just love what you have to say. I mean, you've just really honed an important message not just for um, you know regular people. I mean, you do put it in plain language and you make your work funny and I don't know, you're just like a natural, you're just a natural performer. But you also have these pearls for um, for clinicians. And you know, as you and I were dialoguing, as you know, my podcast is geared towards clinicians. We have a lot of regular people on it as well. And so I want to I want to learn about the book. We're going to cover what you did, and there, you've got a lot of cool areas we're going to drill down into. But I wanted to just get your thoughts on the fact that we're in a really difficult gut epidemic. I mean, there was a time early in our careers where, you know, treating gut health was as simple as pulling out gluten, maybe pulling out dairy, you know, giving them a probiotic. Like it was pretty straightforward. And now it's it's involved and people come back to us with repeat difficulties. We're treating SIBO over and over and over. And it, and and we're just in this new era. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that. And then also the solution. I think there's a lot to say there. Even from looking back in the 80s, the 90s, I know I've, I've spoken to gastroenterologists that said they never saw as much IBS as they've been seeing in the 2000s. And these were you know, people who were in, in practice since the 80s. And I think we have to interlay that with what's been happening to our environment, mm -hmm. to our food supply, the availability of antibiotics, the, the possibility, because I know a lot of people who cross the border and go to Mexico and get their antibiotics just in case at the pharmacy where you don't need a prescription and then bring them back and take them. But that's kind of the world we're living in. 
Um, antibiotics are being overprescribed, and the CDC has even said that. Yeah. It's even worse if you're Hispanic or you're African American, you're more likely to get an antibiotic that you don't need. And there's toxins, toxins in our food, pesticides, glyphosate is a big gut disruptor. Yeah. Really big gut disruptor. I just did an environmental toxicity panel on a patient of mine who is a pilot and and also works as a as a flight instructor and he eats a very at home his diet is pristine organic everything perfect but then when he travels he's got to pick up things and pick up food and sometimes he might be having yeah. meat and whatnot and surprisingly for someone that i've known is really healthy his glyphosate level was super high wow Oh God, that's and honestly, funny. if you had asked me to guess beforehand, you know, this patient, knowing who he is, knowing his physique, knowing how well he takes care of himself, would you guess that his glyphosate level is high or low? I would have said it's low. And so yeah. then we were there sitting during the appointment, just kind of like boggling our minds thinking, well, where is your exposure? And he started, he's, he, we started thinking it must be the food that you're picking up when you're at the airport, the times when you're, you know, you're not on your diet, that you're having bread or you're having a slice of pizza. And, but just think of this is what most Americans are doing. Yeah. And glyphosate is a big gut disruptor because it's a chelating agent, chelates minerals, but it also acts as an antimicrobial agent. And by doing that, it's going to cause a dysbiosis, which then leads to leaky gut and all of the consequences thereof. I think we also can't discount the effect of stress. And I think we have to look at stress from different levels. You know, it's funny because they, they, there's a commercial that ran in the 1970s, or I think it was the 70s, about how the world was going to be a better place. Like they, and they had, like back then, computers filled an entire room <laughs> was yeah. one computer. And it was saying how, like, once the future is going to bring like less work hours. People are going to have more leisure. What has the internet and smartphones done? Right. The complete opposite. Yeah. People are, can never unplug. They're working at nighttime. They're checking email. I think yeah. we're a hyper stimulated society under a lot of stress and a lot of people and and there, we can talk about it. Like there's some studies showing that stress does affect the way that the makeup of the gut microbiome and the way the gut yes. microbiome is behaving. But stress also affects our behavior. What yes. do stressed out people do? They eat, I'm so stressed. Eat garbage. Yeah. But also, I'm so stressed, I need a drink. Right. So the yeah. end of the workday comes and they're having their drink. Maybe they're having two drinks. You're ingesting a socially acceptable major gut disruptor that causes dysbiosis, that increases leaky gut, that uh, increases inflammatory cytokines. So I think that as a society, as we've moved, we're kind of, we've moved away from nature and our connection to nature. And we've moved into every life of convenience and more of an urban life. I think with that has come a lot of these problems. I was also thinking as you were asking the question, plastics, mm -hmm. BPA. Mm -hmm. I mean, BPA also is a gut disruptor and also increases the, the risk for autoimmune disease. All of these things. I was just thinking like, um, I saw a, a company on Instagram yesterday that was saying they just got accepted into Whole Foods and it's a metal bottle water instead of a plastic bottle. And it's almost like we, we've evolved so much into convenience and we've gotten away from where our food comes from. We've gotten away from nature, which is a very important, we can talk about that, like in my experience going to Africa and hanging out with the Hadza hunter gatherers and how that, Oh, influences cool. yeah. and affects the gut microbiome and we're over sanitizing i think the the overuse of hand sanitizers 
the introduction of anti it's it's been shown that triclosan in antibacterial soaps can get absorbed into the body and then has effects on the gut microbiome. Yeah, so, yeah I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not I'm not surprised. And then and then of course, you know, things like mold, like uh, environmental toxins that also affect the gut. I think that all of this adds up to an epidemic of gut disease that is not not just limited to America. I mean, just look at you can almost track gut disease with rising obesity rates, not just in the US, but around the world. The entire world is becoming more and more obese as their diets in other parts of the world become more westernized with highly processed carbohydrates, with lots of sugar, with sugary drinks. And all of this is causing, I think is, is a factor in this epidemic of gut disease. You know, when I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, we rarely went out to dinner. Yeah. And, most, and my grandmother lived with us. Most of our meals were home cooked. Right. You know, so maybe I was eating, I was eating out, I was eating lunch at school, but always, most of the time, maybe we went out once a week to eat. It wasn't, now people are eating out all the time when they have work dinners, so I think there's been a, a really, there's been a drift in the way we lead our lives. And I think that's really part of the reason, along with the, the onslaught of chemicals that have been introduced into the environment. You know, when the Environmental Working Group looked at the placenta, I think they found like 196 different environmental toxins in the placentas that they tested. And these things also affect the gut. Hey there, listeners. It's your host, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. I have a question for you. How much time do you spend ordering functional lab tests for your patients? I bet it's a lot. Ordering from multiple lab companies for hundreds of patients can quickly turn into hours of admin time. But there's a new way to order lab tests I'm excited to share with you. Rupa Health is a tool that lets you order from over 30 specialty labs in a single portal. You can order all the tests you normally do from companies like Dutch, Vibrant, Genova, and Great Plains, and so many more. Imagine you're ordering a hormone panel for a patient that includes tests from three different labs. You have to log onto three different websites, place separate orders, come back weeks later to check on tracking numbers, download results, et cetera, et cetera. Rupa eliminates all of that by having all ordering, tracking results in a single place, and they also handle invoicing, uh, tracking shipments, automated follow-ups, personalized instructions for completing tests, and much more. The best part about Rupa is that it is free for you. Go to rupahealth.com, that's R-U-P-A health.com, and join a live demo or sign up to see how it works. Now let's get back to today's show. That's great. Yeah, I think you, I think you, I think you really covered it. Nice survey of where we are. Um, and it's like the frog, you know, the frog in the pot analogy. You know, it's little by little the heat is turned up. You know, little by little, we sort of wholesale moved into the culture we exist now where we're addicted to our cell phones and so forth. I remember when I got my first smartphone and then I wanna dive into your book. <laughs> Doc, start talking about the solution actually, but I remember getting this my is first actually, smartphone. This is actually really important yeah. part of it because I think, I think when we talk about the gut, a lot of people, first thing they're thinking is, okay, do I take a probiotic and what do I eat? And they forget that stress also is a really important component and the effect of stress. Well, and just to, just to your point, the cultural shift to how where we are today versus what you described in your childhood, which is reflective of my childhood as well. But I just wanted to say it's such a telling and crazy story. I remember standing in line at Starbucks when I had my first smartphone, and there I was in the line in my patient charts. I could access my patient charts. I was finishing a expletive chart in the line at Starbucks. And I was thinking, wow, this is incredibly efficient. Like this was game changing. <laughs> and I, I just thought it was extraordinary. You know, little did I know that, you know, many years later, 
what it would do to my brain. And now, you know, and having to just absolutely wholesale move away from that. It just, it, it was incredible. But I so, I imprinted on that moment, that little aha of, oh my God, I've just become the most extraordinarily productive human in the world. You know, uh, and I, then having- I, I resisted that for so long. I had, I, I forget the brand because they don't exist anymore. I had this yeah. phone that had the keyboard on it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you actually could press the keys. Yeah. But I couldn't check my email on the phone. I couldn't really, you know, go to a lot of websites. And I actually liked it that way because I thought I'm only going to check email when I'm checking email, when I'm down at my desk doing that. I don't want to work while I'm in transit. And I resisted for the longest time not <laughs> getting an iPhone until the brand I had said, we're done. We're not going to make any more of these. And then I had to, I was like, okay, the next thing is a smartphone. And then of course, it's a dopamine hit. You're addicted. Because yeah. then yeah. I could an- answer an email while I'm standing in line in Starbucks. And I thought, wow, yeah. now I don't have to sit at my desk and do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just well, made I- myself more work efficient. Yep. But actually you're adding to your overactivation. Mm-hmm. Overexposure. We I mean, that's a whole other thing. It's overexposure to blue light and what it does to the brain and what it does to sleep and how that messes your sleep up. And and you're never allowing your nervous system to re-regulate itself. You're always amped up. Yeah. And who knew? I mean, it was very insidious. I was like, wow, I'm actually a more productive human right you've now. Gotta, you've got to watch you know, that a documentary, The Social Experiment or something like that, where it's, it's insidious, but it was also very deliberate. They knew what they were doing. Yeah. No, they, no doubt, no doubt, no they, doubt. And they, that's know, why... they know how, how to stimulate the brain in that way. And I know we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about how the gut affects the brain. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Listen, you've been thinking for many, many moons about the optimal diet for gut health. And so you've given us a nice little intro on probably what not to be doing. So what is it? You know, what's, what are the, what, what's the diet that we're supposed to be prescribing these days? You know, I, I've been really evolving over time and yeah. thinking about this. And of course, when, when I speak about diet, I'm putting on my microbiome lenses so I'm looking at the body through the point of view of the microbiome and thinking, you know, how the foods we eat are metabolized by the microbiome and through those metabolites, which are things like exopolysaccharides, back bioactive peptides, short chain fatty acids, how those are either benefiting us or hurting us. And just from recent studies, that we that have come out. Uh, there was a great study from Stanford University that decided to look at a high fiber diet versus a high fermented foods diet. It hmm. was a small group. It was 18 people per arm, mostly women. I think it was 73% women, and it was a varied age group. And interestingly, so they put these people. They either had them eat a high fiber diet, which was about six to eight servings of fiber per day or they had them increase their fermented food intake. So high fermented foods, and we're talking a lot, four to six servings per day. Wow, now, serving and what is, would a, yeah. Serving is a cup. Wow. 200 mLs. Wow, in that study, a serving was a cup. In so that study. Four to six cups of fermented yeah. foods. Yeah, so a lot of it was actually being accomplished through for, uh, fermented vegetable brines where you're drinking, Okay. So it's much easier to, to ingest that much ferment. And of course, they didn't increase them immediately. So they did a four-week ramp up to the desired goal diet. And then six weeks on, on this high fiber or high fermented foods diet. And then they gave them another seven weeks to basically follow the diet in whatever way they wanted to follow it. And they checked the microbiome along the way. And they did it. They did, um, microbiome analysis, looking at microbial diversity. So they wanted to see what affects microbial diversity, high fiber versus high fermented foods. Now, if I was the RRB looking at the the design of this study, 
I would have probably said we need a third arm. We need a control group that's not on a high fiber, not on a high fermented foods diet to give us a little more comparison. But and, and what was the fiber? Was it a variety or was it a single fiber? It was a variety. So increasing things like, like onions, leeks, blueberries, bananas. So all different sources of fiber. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And interestingly, you know, because I when I started reading the study, I was thinking, wow, eat the rainbow, like the fiber, it's all these prebiotics. It's feeding the gut microbiome. Yeah. It's gotta be the one that wins. I was like at the <laughs> Kentucky Derby thinking, like, who's gonna win Who this gonna... <laughs> race? The other cool thing they looked at is they wanted to look at how does it affect the immune system. So they looked at 19 different inflammatory markers. So they wow. were looking at things like C-reactive protein, but they were also looking at cytokine activation of macrophages and white blood cells. So they were looking at a lot of like different ways that the immune system might get activated. And you might, you already probably imagine what the result is because I kind of sort of- You're, le you're leading us. Yeah. I, I, I was us. leading I'm you in that direction. You're, 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 yeah. You're, you're, uh, the, you're Fermented yeah. foods group had the greatest increase in microbial diversity. And as a result, 19 of their inflammatory markers, all 19 markers dropped. Interesting. So immune activation dropped. So now, they had background inflammation. Were these healthy people at start? So they these didn't... were These were just normal people. With some background like, inflammation. Yeah. Like, like everybody in this... Like everybody in this world who's eating, you know, yeah. <laughs> disordered diet. The people before they started the program, they were eating about 10 grams, 10 to 12 grams of fiber per day. Um, some were a little bit higher at 20, but during the during the the diet, they increased that intake at the highest to around 40 grams. In the fiber, in the fiber arm. In the high fiber group. The, the fermented foods group was eating about 0.4 cups of fermented foods during before. And during the, the diet, they increased it to four to six servings. Some of them got as high as six servings per day. And it was always that nutritive broth? It was always that fermented broth? No, it was yogurt. So the majority of them was either vegetable brine and com com combined with yogurt. Mm -hmm. But they, had, they could have other things like sauerkraut, kefir, but it's most of them seem to gravitate towards yogurt and the and the vegetable brine drinks. And but they did something interesting because they found that the fiber rich group did have an effect. It was an immunomodulatory effect. Mm -hmm. And they found that the fiber either increased immune activation or lowered immune activation. Mm -hmm. So they decided to look at the fiber rich group and say, well, Let's look at their baseline microbial diversity before they started yes. the program. And they were able to divide the fiber-rich group into three levels, so low, moderate, and high microbial diversity before they started the diet. And not surprisingly, the group with the highest microbial diversity, when you introduce fiber, what they found was that it actually lowered immune activation a bit. And the one with the lowest microbial diversity, when you added fiber, it actually increased immune activation. Biotics research, I've been using them in practice my entire, entire career. Um, I know my good friend Alex Vasquez is a product designer over there, and he puts together some brilliant form formulations. In fact, you know, lots of people participate in their fabulous designs. They have some of the best gut uh, botanical combinations out there that have been researched as effective in IBS. We use them in SIBO. They have perhaps the best form of oregano oil, ADP. It's an enteric coated uh, product that you know we've been using in practice since it was first released. Um, they've got serum bovine immunoglobulin. They've got a host of fabulous probiotics with um, good efficacy and uh, adequate potency, sufficient potency. So anyway, check them out. So there was something there about microbial diversity. And I think this is a really important study to reference when you're asking me, what is the best diet for gut health? 
because I honestly don't think that it's fiber versus ferments. I think it's both. Mm -hmm. We well, need what? both. The, I agree with you. I just want to circle back to the finding that the immune system was actually stimulated in those with the lowest fiber at baseline and why lowest, you think- uh, uh, microbial diversity. Oh, lowest microbial diversity at baseline. They introduced the fiber. So diversity is obviously going to be stimulated in that context. And they turned the immune system on. Did they infer that this was beneficial or were they looking at this as inflammation? I mean, was there sort of a, a regulatory process happening? What, they, were, yeah, what do you they, think? they looked at it as it being more of a regulatory process. Mm -hmm. And the other comment that they had was that they they also felt that potentially had the study been longer, they might have seen that the fiber rich group also started to have an impact on microbial diversity, but they felt that maybe the study wasn't long enough, especially the intervention part, to come to that conclusion. Maybe it had it been two months, three months long, they would have started seeing, or sorry, longer than, because it was already 10 weeks, so longer than that. Yeah. Maybe they would have seen changes in microbial diversity. That makes sense. That makes sense because in the ferment group, they're they're consuming, you know, billions and billions of species in the in the and, in the and actually, and actually, we can tie this into the Hadza, the hunter gatherers in Tanzania, yeah, because okay. their gut microbiome is super fascinating. And the cool thing is that they still live in a region of the world where they are still they're living like our Paleolithic ancestors. And I think this is a crazy fact, but for 95% of human evolution, we've been hunter gatherers. So domesticating animals, growing agriculture, all of that is just the last small snippet of our evolutionary history, which goes way further back. And, and so an interesting thing is we see, like as we see in, in other studies, that the types of foods that you eat shape your microbiome. And their microbiome is quite different because they actually have tryponemas in their microbiome. Yeah. Right. And, and we think of tryponema as bad, right? Tryponema pallidum causes syphilis, uh, causes all sorts of neurological issues. Somehow in them, they're able to keep it immunologically checked but the tryponema serves a very important purpose because it's able to, to digest xylans and cellula cellulose in plant material and their diets are super high in plant tubers, especially the women. So they, they interestingly, they found, they did a study where they looked at 27 Hatsa, their stool, aging anywhere from eight to 70 years old. And then they had an Italian cohort that they use as a control, the Western control. So you can imagine Italians eating Mediterranean diet, pasta, tomatoes, basil, so legumes, so very diet, so one of the healthiest diets mm -hmm. on the planet. And they compared their gut microbiomes to each other. And it was really interesting because they also did meta metabolomic analysis. So they were looking mm -hmm. at what types of short chain fatty acids were being produced. And you would guess just like in the West, the predominant uh, short chain fatty acid for the Italians was butyrate. But for the Hadza, it wasn't, it was propionate. Hmm. Interesting. And you gotta wonder, okay, why is this happening? Well, turns out that propionate is used by the liver for gluconeogenesis. So it becomes an energy source for the body. And and you know the hmm. Hadza are hunter gatherers, so they're going to be periods where they have to fast, where food is not available. So they postulate that maybe this is part of their adaptation. The other interesting thing is that, and this is from another study, so I'm going to tie this back to stress because mm -hmm. I want to mention something about the Hadza. I mean, they are remarkable mm -hmm. people. They're living out in the bush. It's semi-arid. It's not the friendliest of conditions and they're out in nature. They're getting rained on. They are happy, joking. Like we couldn't understand the language, but we had <laughs> such an amazing time, like through 
through using hand signals and sounds and things like listening to the chief speak around the fire pit about lions. And he would like make, he would make like all these and he would talk about an elephant and you, you knew what he was talking about, although you had no idea what he was saying. And he was teaching us the names of the different animals. And through the translator, we asked him if they have a word for depression. And they didn't understand. And we kept asking, like, they're like, no. Like, no. It doesn't compute. They have no word for depression in their language. Now, how does this tie into the hypropionate? Well, there was a study that showed that hypropionate is associated with alterations in the gut brain access that increase stress resilience. Hmm. That's fascinating. That's so fascinating. It, I think that there was an animal study that suggested hypropionate was associated with autistic like behavior and there was sort of a a vilification that's of the fatty acid. I know, yeah. I know that propionate, you know, when I encountered this, I remember that that it got a lot of press in our in our propionate was vilified because thinking that yeah. it, it's associated with autism. And then I saw this study and saw, wait a second. I it was an, again one of those moments where I'm reading it and thinking, okay, they're just gonna have really high butyrate because mm -hmm. we learn how that's great we butyrate know. is. Yeah, it's that's yeah. anti-inflammatory, it does all these things. And no, they didn't have high butyrate. And the other thing that was really strange is they had no bifidobacteria in their gut. Wow, fascinating. And the only thing that they did, and the researchers commented that they needed to, they, they said a good, uh, one thing to do would be to go back and test the stool of infants. Yeah, when we have the most bifido. To yeah, to see on. if, because they think that what happens, and, and then they looked at across other rural populations, mm -hmm. and it seems like um, if they're not having dairy products, that bifido disappears. Whereas, of course, in the Italian control, bifido was there, and bifido is one of the butyrate producers, along with Clostridia species. So it becomes very important for us, but apparently not for them. They're, they have a completely different... And, and the other thing that I think, I think really is very telling about the gut microbiome is that they're one of the few groups where the microbiome is slightly different between men and women. And the reason for it is the women stay in camp while the men, they're the ones who go out foraging, hunting, getting wild honey. And even though there's, there's a cross between their diet, ultimately the women end up eating more tubers, a much higher fiber diet, and the men probably eat a little more animal product. In general, they eat about 70% plants, 30% animals. But they were postulating that because of this, because interestingly, the women's gut had more treponema than the men's. And the treponema helped break down all those really difficult to digest plant fibers. Wow. Well, listen, I have two questions. One, I'm curious how you ended up there. I'm just, but give me like a snapshot because we've got a lot to cover. I'm just, I want to know oh the Oh my backstory. goodness. Um, wait, 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 wait okay, then I'm, I'm going to ask you a question too, and then you can answer both. Yeah. What did you take from your experience there that has informed what you're talking to us about today? So yeah. what, what did you, what are you, what are you bringing back to us from that experience? And, and I will mention uh, that this was one of the experiences that shaped this book. And I actually talk about the awesome. Hatsa and my experience there in one of the chapters in the book. Um, you know what? It was a connection through a group that I went to Burning Man with. Oh, cool. Okay. That I was on a WhatsApp chat thread and one of the guys who his brand is called Wild Fit, Eric Edmonides, or I, I don't know how to say his last name. It's a Greek last name. He put, put out an invitation saying he's taking a group of people to go to Africa and to go um, hang out with the Hadza. And yeah. I had just wow. heard a whole lecture on the Hadza and I had looked at this, these research studies about their gut. 
And I immediately raised my hand. I was like, like a meant to be moment. Wow. Take me. I want to go. And it was incredible. We spent three days, two nights. I mean, I was scared because we were camping out in the wilderness <laughs> and they actually put a guard out for us wow. and, and had a fire going all night, but we were in a part of the what would what what was the why was the guard and the fire required? I mean, there could be hyenas, uh, yes, and there could be snacks. there could be it would be rare. There could be a lion or lioness, but that would be a little more rare because they weren't in that territory, but they were more in an area where hyenas could come through. And and it was a little bit scary, but we were all sleeping under this big tree, and we were it's like a group of like probably. 15 or 17 of us total. And of course, you know, when you're with people, you kind of feel like protection in numbers, <laughs> but, but you're still a little bit freaked out because you're, you're in the <laughs> middle of the wilderness. But it was an amazing experience. I got to go hunting and foraging with them, ate a tuber right out of the ground, had honey, not just honey, but like the, the honeycomb, the tiny little non-stinging honeybees in Africa, they look like tiny flies. They just poured it in my hand and I was like, okay, I can't be rude. I have to just have this just like everybody else. And it, I mean, look, it, it creates an incredibly diverse gut microbiome. And I think there's a lot of things yeah. to learn from the Hadza. And part of what I took from there is, and I, and I sat with the chief and through the translator asked him like, what do you do if you get a pneumonia or like, if you do you guys get sick? And they have all these herbal remedies that have been passed down. And he was very secretive about it. And he's like, we don't reveal what they are, but they have herbs that they, they pull and they don't take antibiotics. So they haven't been exposed to antibiotics. They're not exposed to hand sanitizers, antibacterial soaps. They don't have that concept. They're out in the wilderness. So their, their gut microbiome from a diet that is basically meat, berries, honey, baobab fruit, and whatever they can forage, it's not a very color varied diet. It's not a rainbow diet. So I, I really started thinking about it, you know, but it's a very high fiber diet. They're having like 50, 40 to 50 grams of fiber, just like they did in that intervention group where they got them up to around 40 grams of fiber per day. But I think it's not just that. I think it's that they're out in the wild. They're getting exposed to nature. They're getting exposed to the microbiome and the soil. They're touching. They're not, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. some of that yeah. gets, gets into them. And I think that it's augments their microbial diversity Yes, and has, and they're also kind of like, if you think about it, they're they're a window into the ancestral gut microbiome of what might have existed in Paleolithic times. Yeah. Here is big news. Great Plains Laboratory is now Mosaic Diagnostics. Mosaic Diagnostics is where functional medicine practitioners turn to reveal the complete picture of their patient's underlying illnesses through evidence-based diagnostic testing. Get to know Mosaic Diagnostics by visiting Mosaic giveaway.com. Licensed practitioners can enter to win Mosaic's Business Booster Giveaway. It's $875 worth of test discounts, supplements, free educational passes, and a one-hour massage for your self-care. Visit mosaicgiveaway.com for your chance to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think what's important, what's really mm -hmm. important, okay, why are we so fascinated with them? And what are you, what, how does it, how, how, how did it create the gut smart protocol? How does the, your experience with the Hunza inform well, where you are I just want to, I just want yeah, to just quickly diverge and say, you know, why, why all this fascination with this? So first I said, microbial diversity is the holy grail. Microbial diversity decreases inflammation, decreases the risk for all sorts of chronic degenerative diseases, including mental illness, like yeah. depression. They have no heart disease. They have no diabetes. They have no obesity. They have no cancer. Then they have no depression. They don't even have a word for depression. They don't have <laughs> depression. So I think that's that's part of the significance of the hot size scene. It's not like we're going to go and become hunter gatherers. 
But part of what I tell people in my book is, you know, what we need to take from this is that do whatever you can to get outside into nature. If you have a yard, like make your own garden, like bring in organic soil, get your hands dirty, have grow your own vegetables, like because we need that exposure to the natural world, to dirt, to magnify and diversify our own gut microbiome. Yeah, there's, and that's been studied. There's this, there's this region um, in, in just in where Russia and, and Finland meet. Um, I don't want to misstate state the region. I think it's Karolinka, my apologies. I'm probably not quite saying that. The Finnish side is completely developed. So their agriculture, it's developed. It's modern agriculture. You know, things are chopped down. There's no more forest, et cetera. And they're using, you know, they're using pesticides, et cetera. And then on the Russia side, it's, they're using old farming techniques. You know, they're using, the, the forest is vibrant. They're, you know, agribusiness hasn't descended. You know, they're not using modern and they're just really intimate with the forest and with the plants, with, the, with, with nature. Allergic disease is rampant in the Finland side, you know, just classic all of the stuff that we see here and it's non-existent in the Russian side. And they look at skin micro, um, the, the skin microbiome and they then they studied the plant to your point, the plant's microbiome, like they studied the microbiome in the environment and they see this radical difference between the two. Obviously over in the modernized side, it's really damaged and it's, and it's, it's contract, diversity has contracted. And we see the, you know, the commensurate diseases of chronic of, of the modern era rising with that and they don't see it in Russia. So to your, to your point. Yeah, the same thing that you see that happens to the gut with antibiotics, which is another takeaway yeah. from the hot side, especially if you're, you know, you can't, you can't go back and erase the past, but if you're a parent or you're, a, or if you're a parent to be sometime in the future, you can make different choices for your child and try to keep them away from antibiotics as much as possible. My son, who's 18 years old, has only been on two rounds of antibiotics his entire life. That's it. And that's as a parent, as a doctor who, you know, I've, I'm, I was willing to take the risk because we could observe him that most times he was sick, it was a viral infection. And the one time he was seven or eight years old and he had an ear infection that just was not budging. Yeah. And we ended up having to put him on antibiotics and he, and he responded immediately. But I think it's important to try to limit your exposure to antibiotics until only if they're absolutely necessary. And to equate that to what's happening to the soil, I said glyphosate pesticides are like antimicrobials. The same thing that is happening to our gut microbiome is happening to the microbiome of the soil because of the use of glyphosate. And they've looked at the, the shifts in the microbiome of the soil on soil with crops that are genetically modified that get sprayed with glyphosate because they're glyphosate resistant crop. And they find that the soil microbiome starts to shift into some harmful types of bacteria that are not good for the soil the soil loses its microbial diversity. And then we're supposed to eat those plants that are growing on this less diverse soil that have less nutrients and minerals because you're, you're spraying them with a mineral chelator to kill the weeds, but it's also starving the very plants that we're supposed to eat of the minerals. So another big lesson is just seeing that we're not in isolation. Like what's happening here to your body is partly because of what's happening out there. Yeah. And because of that, I think for the choice of our health, for our patients, we've got to encourage them to buy organic as much as possible, shop at local farmers markets, like buy local and try to reduce your exposure to these harmful substances but also because organic food has more antioxidants, it has higher polyphenol counts, it's just gonna be better for you. But organic, like agribusiness organic is not as robust as local. 
Not as robust. And, and I can tell you, I, I see the difference when I would go to my organic farmer um, in my old neighborhood. And I used to, I, I still will go back there from time to time. They're an organic farm. They're from Egypt. And her husband is an engineer and he decided to go back and study the ancient way, agricultural ways that were being used back in the, the, the time of the Egyptian culture, like the, pharaohs. With the, the, the pharaohs with the Nile. And it's basically wow. an organic technique and they apply it to the way that they grow their food. But they also, I, I know this, this might get it a little bit woo woo, but they, they also pray over their vegetables. They pray over their plants. Kara, the produce that I get from them will stay fresh in my refrigerator four to five times longer than anything that I buy mass produced organic. Hmm. That's fascinating. Are, are you in the city? I'm in, yeah, I'm in New York City. So they have a farm in the city? No, their farm is in upstate, I, I they... think pretty far upstate New York. Okay. Yeah, it's called Norwalk Farm. Yeah. And then they bring stuff in and they sell it. In the they city. they drive in. It takes them like four hours to get here. And oh, so they're, they way are, they're way it's out. It's just amazing. You know, when, and the other thing is like when you go to the farmer's market and you meet the farmer, like, and you get so much closer to where your food comes from, I think there's, there's such a greater level of appreciation for what it takes. Awesome. I love it. Tim, what's the name of this farm again? Since I'm not, I'm, they're called, I'm, I'm not they're, actually, they're called Norwalk Farm and they, they've actually been written up in the New York Times because a lot of the high-end restaurants in New York City will buy produce from them because they have very rare varietals, heirloom varietals that cannot be found anywhere else that they've preserved. That's pretty cool. That's really interesting. Um, listen, I just, this is a little bit of a left field question. What do you think of Himalayan tartary buckwheat? Our, our mentor, Dr. Jeff Bland, of course, is, is growing it and he's growing it. it, it the, I think the first, the first farms are in upstate New York, which is what made me think of it. But it's kind of a, I think it's kind of a little bit of a badass nutrient that I find interesting. And have you given it any thought? Is it on your radar at all, Himalayan tartary buckwheat? It's, it's sort of like peripherally. I mean, okay. it's, if it's a, it, it's buckwheat, so it's gluten-free. The thing that's interesting about it, and maybe you'll you'll check it out, and I, I have more questions for you, so I don't want to digress here too much, is that it grows in the Himalaya, and it's it grows in such um, difficult environments that it just it just it's busting at the seam with those sophisticated, you know, polyphenol phytochemicals beyond just polyphenols. Yeah. It's just loaded up with these kind of. So it's almost like the, like what you said is that that st it's hermetic stressor. Yes, creates a stronger plant with greater antioxidants. And, and even though like, I don't talk about this, but I do talk about hormetic stress in my book and tie it back to look at the Hadza, you know, living out in the environment, but also things that we can do that can improve our stress resilience. But that's fascinating. I'm gonna now. Yeah, now check it's it out. My, now yeah. it's in my radar. So yeah. it's Himalayan. Himalayan tartary buckwheat. Himalayan tartary, tartary buckwheat. buckwheat. And I'm I'm just I'm I'm personally bullish on it. You know, just because of the the quantity. And they've analyzed for the um. You know, they they quantified. There's a such a huge variety of of phytochemicals in it, and of robust amounts of therapeutic amounts. And you can buy it as a flour, and you can make pancakes, or you can take it you know, in capsules and get a therapeutic amount in a few caps because it's so ridiculously potent. So it fits, it's certainly in alignment with your, with your. And thinking. I love these uh, non-gluten grains that we can introduce into our diets because, yeah. you know, even though, you know, wheat is contaminated with glyphosate and we've got to be really careful with that. Yeah. And they're, really mindful around how they're growing it but just i know that it started in new york state and i think that it's still just only grown in just you know a few a few areas in upstate new york i'm keep going this way because new york is that way for me sitting in my desk. <laughs> i'm right next new york, york is here and, <laughs> and there, there. That way. <laughs> um 
Okay, so I just I want to say that I love your the uh, just the breadth and the the energy around how you're how you've taken the gut smart protocol. Um, just this very holistic approach. It's extremely broad, and and I want to. So I do want to get to brass tacks, like how much fiber should we be eating? What should we be eating? How much fermented um, foods should we be eating? Should we be going for four to six cups as they did in this study? I, I, I want to get that. Um, but I just want you to give me the overview of what your protocol looks like, you know, so, and beyond the diet, you know, what, how are we doing? What, what is our, how do we build resilience? You know, how do we become a little bit like Bahamas are here in the States. So many, there's so many golden nuggets for people in, in my book um, for building resilience in different ways. But the, the pivot point of the program is taking the gut smart quiz, finding out what your gut smart score is. You get a number score, but you also get a qualitative score. The number score is from 25 to 450. The qualitative will be mild, moderate, or severe. And that basically breaks you down into categories. And why is that important? It's important because if you're in a severe category, you can't eat the same as someone who has mild gut issues. And this is what I wanted. This was a really big challenge, Cara, to basically figure out how in one book can I help all the variety of people that I've noticed and seen through my 10 plus years of being a you know, really diving into gut health and seeing so many gut patients and realizing that you can't just save one diet for all. If someone is classified as severe, they very they they have leaky gut, no question. They've got a lot of gut dysbiosis. And they can have fermented foods. Yeah. And they That's might right. also have trouble eating raw vegetables. They might have to stick with cooked veggies only and certain types of veggies that are not going to irritate the gut so much. So people go through the protocol and, and follow it. And there's a lot of, oh, there's so many layers to it, like learning how to be intuitive about your eating, like listening to your body, you know, because the other thing is, and, and I know you preach this also, that ultimately the healer is you. And as much as we can provide guidance, and I, I went through extremes like consulted with clinical nutritionists, consulted with fermentationists to really dial down like what should be in each category and how should we treat this. But even then, something might be wrong for a person. They've got to develop that inner intuition. It takes a village to make a good podcast, and this one is no exception. I would not be here month in and month out interviewing the best minds in functional medicine if it wasn't for our generous sponsors. I want to give extra shout out to our diamond level sponsors, Rupa Health and Biotics Research. Rupa Health has taken the functional medicine world by storm because they are taking these functional laboratory testing and making them really easy for us clinicians, as well as for our patients. So we know functional laboratory testing is an essential component of our work with our patients. However, the lab testing, quite frankly, is a pain. Collection is different. Um, we have to fill out various rec forms. Uh, we're sending them all over the place. We're keeping kits in office, et cetera, et cetera. Rupa Health has streamlined this entire journey and I love them for it. And if you haven't started to use Rupa Health, you are in for a great, great, great treat. But another really important piece of this is like developing that that stress resilience, that inner strength. And it all comes down in in my opinion, it has to do with the vagus nerve. And we we started at the very beginning talking about stress and the effects on the body and, and why has gut, gut issues become so much worse? Well, another player is low vagal tone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Low vagal tone is associated with acid reflux, with constipation, with poor digestion, less ability to break down proteins. It's also associated with things you wouldn't think are associated with low vagal tone, like migraines, anxiety, depression. All of these things are tied to low vagal tone. So I talk about ways that you can activate, reactivate the vagus nerve. 
And like you said, the plan is very holistic. It's, it's not just how you eat, it's how you live your life. And for that reason, I devoted a whole chapter to talking about the role of the vagus nerve, why it's so important, how you can activate it using different types of hormetic stressors, even like cold plunging, or even just getting cold water on your face and your neck, where there are cold receptors that will activate your vagus nerve, or using things like humming, or even just here, like grabbing the tragus mm -hmm. and stimulating it. These are ways that you can reactivate that vagus nerve and then using breath work and meditation. And one of my favorites actually was I took, when I was writing the book, I, I had three different meditation teachers that I wanted to contribute in three breath work teachers. And I actually ended up with, with uh, more, but there was one meditation teacher that kept saying, they'll get back to me, they'll get back to me. And finally, I just needed to finish this chapter. And I'm like, I'm not going to wait for you to get back to me. <laughs> but I've been meditating since I was 21. And I've done a lot of different meditations. And one of, the med one of my favorite meditations is the Tibetan loving kindness meditation. Mm -hmm. And one big thing that I've noticed with people when they have chronic disease, when they have chronic gut issues, is that they start treating their gut as if it's their enemy. It's not their friend anymore. They develop an antagonistic relationship with that part of themselves. And so I took that Tibetan loving kindness meditation and turned it into the gut love meditation. I love it. That's really great. And basically yeah. just reteaching people how to reframe that relationship with themselves which I think is really important piece of the healing journey yes. is re rewriting that relationship with your sick body, whatever it is, whatever that chronic health issue is and not letting the chronic health issue or the chronic gut issues or whatever they are be the defining factor in who you are. And so you asked, how much fiber should we eat? How much uh, fermented foods should we eat? That makes me think of another study that came out in December. I think it was in Nature. And they took about, I think it was about 45 people and they divided them into two groups. These were healthy people that um, were just normal living their lives. And they wanted to look at the effect of stress, right? And whether diet influences how stress is perceived in the brain. So they weren't going to psychotherapy. So oh. they all did a, a standardized um, perceived stress questionnaire. It's called the, the Cohen's uh, PSS, perceived stress questionnaire. And they divided them into two groups. One was a control group that was just given general dietary guidelines. This was in Ireland. So I guess they have their own dietary pyramid that they told people to eat, you know, less processed foods, whatever. And then another group where they asked them to increase their fiber to six to eight servings per day, grains to five to eight servings per day, and ferments to two to three servings, not the four to six that was in the other study. And they found that there was a statistically significant difference in the, in the post-test stress score. And it was only a four-week study. But the, the intervention group, they dropped their stress score by 32%. Whereas the control group, it was 17%. The difference was statistically significant enough to say the diet did something. It's doing something through the modulation of the gut microbiome. Interestingly, they were looking at microbial volatility, which is the change. It's the, it, they were looking at this Atchison Ach, Ach, uh, score, like a change in beta diversity over time. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that if the, if the volatility was really high, stress scores tended to be higher. If the, volati if the volatility, volatility was low, the change in, in the microbiome was low, stress scores dropped. And they found mm -hmm. that in the intervention group, the volatility, volatility was lower. In the control group, volatility tended to be high. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And so you look at this and you think, wow, like diet 
can modulate the way the brain is functioning, just kind of tying back to like how stress affects the gut, but the gut also affects our stress perception through the gut brain axis. And it makes me think you know, that it's hard for people to eat a lot of ferments, right? Like you tell people two to three servings per day. And again, take the gut smart quiz, figure out if ferments are right for you or not yet. But I think we need to be thinking about them and we need to be increasing our vegetable intake. And I know you talk about this in your book, Younger You, that we're, we're not getting enough vegetables. Like the amount that we need in order to change the microbiome and then epigenetically change the way our genes are being expressed is much higher than what we're getting. And I think what, what I'm inserting in there is that we've also like the, the ferments, they're like, hey, we've been around for 10,000 years. Uh, <laughs> we were, we were first used in China like 7,000 years ago <laughs> when they were fermenting rice, honey, and grains. And we need that. That's part of what creates this diversity, but also this resilience, this lowering of inflammatory markers that makes people much healthier, both physically and mentally. And this is the gut smart protocol. You know, um, we're we're just we're we're at the end of our podcast. I think this has been such a lovely conversation. I have to say, it's just such an unexpected, delightful conversation. We, um, I want to give you a, an opportunity to just touch on anything you feel like you need to touch on, but the way that you taken really this is like system medicine psychic medicine you know it's just it it, it, it has I mean it, it of course it's the solution to this gut epidemic that we're in you know just kind of unraveling and taking us back to where we were and I like how broad and inclusive the the quiz is because we have patients of course walking through our doors who have been eating four foods you know, for the last month, that's all they can tolerate, or maybe even longer, right? And they're malnourished and they're afraid of food, you know, and their gut is the enemy. There is this volatile relationship. The fact that you brought loving kindness medicine, med meditation to the gut is just like a stroke of utter brilliance, you know, because that patient coming through our door is, you know, and more with themselves. And, um, and you can't heal a body that you don't love. And if, and, yeah. And so there's this step by step. So the fact that your protocol really acknowledges that and there's no force, you're not forcing, I mean, you'll lose, you'll, you'll lose folks if you're insisting that this one defined diet is the correct diet. There has, you know, there's, there's a journey towards restoring. I get that. So I appreciate and, and, that and also, capture. I think we can learn a lot by seeing you know, there's so many examples, like I'm, I'm so curious about the blue zones and, and mm -hmm. we didn't get sure. into this, but, but I've been curious about the gut microbiome as we age and what's different about the gut microbiome of centenarians versus people who don't live yeah. to become a yeah, hundred. Yeah, yeah. Well, we know and diversity is a piece, certainly. Diversity is a piece. And, and one other part of it is you're, I, I'm going to say stress resilience. The ability yeah. of their microbiome to lower inflammation, whereas others who don't live as long, their microbiome loses the ability as we age. A lot of people, their microbiome ages in a way that it loses the ability to control yeah. inflammation in the body. Whereas you look at these centenarians and their microbiome still has the ability to bring down inflammation. Oh, interesting. I mean, I knew diversity was a piece and then you would, ex from ex extend on that and assume that they're influencing obviously some of the breakdown but yeah that's fascinating that that's been evaluated um what else is there anything that you would like to leave us with i know that we could probably talk for another two hours but <laughs> i think god i really um i feel like we've had such a great conversation and i'm so appreciative of being able to share uh these musings that i have like i've I haven't stopped looking at the literature since I fit, turned in my manuscript because stuff just keeps coming out. You know, there was a study in December that showed that 13 different bacterial taxa are associated with depression. Hmm. And one avenue to depression is the production of TMA from a bacteria mm -hmm. called Hungatella, 
that then gets converted to TMAO, which we know increases stroke and heart disease risk. But I didn't know that TMAO also increases risk of depression. Yeah, that's interesting. I did not know that. So, I mean, God, I, I just can't wait for people to read this book. And I think you captured a lot of pieces of it that it's, it's really, it's really a holistic mind, body, uh, gut plan. <laughs> I want to show one other thing that, oh, that you sent me that I just really can't wait to use. It's a, for my, a fermenting fermentation. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. I can't wait to, I can't wait to, I can't wait to bust this that out. That was such a home. nice gift from Swami, uh, that creates these, uh, fermentation kits that are already easily like has the spring mechanism so it can uh, let the gas go out super, super cool. excited about that uh yeah. i i really appreciate being on your podcast and and sharing this information i think that it can be so empowering to people we need answers you know we're in a challenging time and i think that we've we've got to reverse the train because we're on a train that's heading towards a cliff. Yeah. And or perhaps not only need to, midway. It's already like midway. Like we've got to put, <laughs> pull the brakes and then hit the reverse engines uh, because it's, it's not pretty where society is going. Yeah. I think that you've given us some tools though to, um, to begin to unwind it. And it's not another course that's like Vaxxer. <laughs> no. A lot more. No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Dr. Pedro, thank you loads and loads and loads for coming on the show. And I wish you the best of luck in your book. We'll certainly be supporting Gut Smart Pro Protocol, um, not in this podcast, obviously, but just, you know, more broadly in our, in our social media. It's a good, it's really good work that you've done. It's really inspiring. Thank you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> As always, thank you for listening to New Frontiers in Functional Medicine, where because of my sponsors, I am able to bring you the best minds in functional medicine. And of course, today is no exception. Not everybody can be a sponsor on my platform. So I appreciate the good work, the relentless research, and the generous support from my friends at Rupa Health, Biotics Research, and Integrative Therapeutics. These are brands I know and trust in my own clinic, and I can confidently recommend them to you. Visit them at rupahealth.com, bioticsresearch.com, and integrativepro.com. And please let them know that you learned about them on New Frontiers. And if it's not too much to ask, I would really appreciate a thumbs up or a kind review wherever you're listening to New Frontiers. Thanks.